Guys, I'm excited to introduce our speaker this morning. You can read it in depth on his bio on, on the website, but Dr. John Tolson has done a lot of different things in his life, but the one thing that he has made his mark is on impacting the lives of men about discipleship. And I'm excited to hear what he has to say today. And would you guys please welcome Rousing Wingman, round of applause for John Tolson. I don't know if any of you have uh, kids in college. Anybody have kids in college or you think they're going to be, be permanently in college? <laughs> that can happen. Well, this couple uh, lived on the uh, west coast, or excuse me, on the east coast, and their daughter wanted to go to school on the west coast, and she was really a sharp, smart gal, and they didn't want her to go to school on the west coast, or if any of you from the west coast, you know all the funky stuff happens out in, on the west coast, and eventually waves, it makes its way back to Texas and on back to the east. But anyway, she prevailed. Can we turn that down just a little bit, whoever's doing the sound, because I'm going to get real loud. Um, Anyway, so she prevailed and went to school on the West Coast. A week goes by, two weeks goes by, three weeks goes by, no emails, no faxes, no phone calls, no letters, no nothing. Then finally one day, this letter comes in the mail. Dear Mom and Dad, I'm sorry that I have not written to you for so long, but all my stationery was lost the night the dormitory was burned down by the demonstrators. I'm out of the hospital now. The doctor says my eyesight should be back to normal sooner or later. The wonderful boy Bill who rescued me from the fire kindly, kindly offered to share his apartment with me until I found a new place to live. You always wanted a grandchild. <laughs> so you'll be glad to know that you'll be grandparents next month. Love, Mary. Then at the bottom there was a P.S. Please disregard the above exercise in creative writing. There was no fire. I haven't been in the hospital. I'm not pregnant. In fact, I don't even have a boyfriend. But I did get a D in French and an F in mathematics. I want to make sure that you receive this news in the proper perspective. <laughs> so I hope you receive what I'm going to say today in the proper perspective. I don't get up this early uh, to waste your time or mine. I really appreciate Chad asking me uh, to be here today. I have spent the last 40 years of my life around this country working with men, and it's a privilege. Uh, I see a lot of men uh, that have been very successful in business, have made millions and billions of dollars, but in their personal lives are screwed up. And it's sad when a man has all that going, but he doesn't really get going. One time a friend of mine asked in a college class somewhere around the country, he asked the students, how long have you lived? And somebody raised their hand and said, 22 years. He said, no, I'm not saying how many years. How many minutes in your life have you really lived? Have you really been alive? Because there really is a difference between living and existing. And there are a lot of men that I know in this city, in the DFW area and around the country, they have no clue how to come alive. A friend passed this along to me recently <clears throat> where he was speaking. He had made some notes on this uh, event. Listen. About a dozen gray-haired men sat at the table in a prestigious country club. All former executives who had been highly successful, leaders, champions, bright, intelligent minds, these were risk takers who led big lives, checkered with success and failure. Married between 45 and 60 years, these men clearly had plenty to impart, to impart to a younger generation. As I prepared to speak to them, my friend said, I couldn't help but think that their gray heads only added to their dignity. They had asked me to speak for 10 minutes about what family life, his, this guy's work, was doing to strengthen families and marriages around the country. As I unpacked what we were doing, I mentioned that I would be speaking to a gathering of executives a couple of days later on three qualities of a patriarch. What happened next was fascinating. It was as though I had touched an open nerve. For 45 minutes, they peppered me with questions, peeling back their hearts, sharing their disappointments, frustrations, doubts, and desires. They talked about how their adult children were critical of them pushing them to the fringes of their lives. 
They were treated as unnecessary, except as babysitters. And they felt their family really didn't want their influence or their involvement. They said the only opportunities their churches offered were ushering, serving on the stewardship committee, and giving to the building programs. They lamented that the culture had become so youth-oriented, they felt emasculated, treated as though they were done, had, and had nothing to give back. These men who had once been kings in their families, their businesses, and in their communities, were for the first time in their lives uncertain what their roles should be. Like broken, this, is, this line really got me, like broken antiques gathering dust in the attic, they were without purpose. But as they interacted, I could see in their eyes that they longed to be challenged again. War-hardened, savvy, these sage soldiers wanted to fill their nostrils with the smoke of the battlefield and engage in the fight once again. They really didn't want to trade their swords, their swords and their armor for a five iron and a golf shirt. They realized they were made for something far nobler than watching cable news in a lazy boy recliner. I sat there astonished at what amounted to grand theft. Men robbed of their glory no longer dreaming because of a complicity of forces that had cruelly swindled them out of their courage to step up. These men had been left behind, disoriented, and lost. Gentlemen, uh, to me, one of the saddest things in the world is to see a man waste his life. Life is too short to get it wrong. We only go through this life one time, unless you believe in reincarnation. Only one time, one time. And to, to see a man look back someday and, and have regrets for having been on the bench, not really been in the game of life that, that God has called us to through his son, Jesus Christ, is really a shame. So what I want to talk about today is the subject that is deepest on my heart. And if you have any interest at all in, in getting more than just another talk, more information, uh, then this is for you today. And by the way, if you have something to take notes with, I would uh, encourage you to do that because one of the things a growing, maturing disciple does is take notes. Unless you have a photographic memory, you write stuff down that people say here, Chad or other speakers, because you not only want to remember that and use that for you, but you want to pass it along. So I encourage you to do that. If you don't, you'll break out with some fever or something. But anyway, <laughs> so... Jesus begins his ministry, and he pulls together a few men, but he's got, a, in the very beginning, a very tough message. So if you look at uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, the scripture says, From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You know, Zig Ziglar, that's a tough message for, a, for, a, for an inspirational speaker to use. Repent. Turn or burn, leap or weep, dunk or flunk. I mean, he was laying it flat on the line. Then he goes on, not only with the message, but the challenge. If you look in verse 18, and Jesus walked by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon and Peter, Andrew, his brother, casting a net. Then he said to them, follow me, and I'll help you make more money. Is that what he said? Help me, follow me, and I'll help you catch more fish. Is that what he said? Follow me and do what? And make you a fisher of men. He not only gave them an assignment back then, but that assignment goes on to you and me this morning. And we need to remember that. But then he goes from there over to chapter number 5 of Matthew. And from 5, 6, and 7, which is called, as most of you know, the Sermon on the Mount, he pulls out his spiritual scalpel. And he begins to dig down deeply into these guys' hearts to help them to become the men that he knows they need to be, that he wants them to be. Because, you know, I, I love studying leadership. You know, I always think of, we're going to look at a verse in a minute, Matthew 28, where he said, go therefore into all the world make disciples. But if you back it up to chapter 24 and 25, he says, listen, guys, I'm going to leave. They're going to put me on a cross. I'm going to suffer, die, rise from the dead. And then I'm leaving. I've given you this, this assignment, Matthew 28, to change the world. And the question I've always had is, why didn't they fold up like an accordion when he left? What did he do with them so that when he was gone and all hell broke loose, they didn't fold up? 
You got to go back to Matthew 5, 6, and 7 when he pulled out that spiritual scalpel and began, and began to dig down deep in their heart to change them from the inside out. Our problem is a lot of time, there is no dearth of, of great preaching in Dallas, Texas. I've never been any place like it. But there's also, I've never seen a place that has such lack of depth in terms of the inside of a man. And men, because of that inside factor, are making a difference all across this city and around the country. I see very few people doing that. Handful. That's it, at best. So we got to really ask, do we really want, do we really want to make a difference? Here's another thought in, in my preliminary comments here. You are no more prepared for heaven than the moment Jesus came into your life or comes into your life. You're no more prepared for heaven. The scripture says he justifies you, which is a legal term whereby a man is proclaimed free from all sin and guilt based upon the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross plus nothing else. So if you're justified, made right with God through Christ, why didn't he take us on in? Why does he leave us here? It ain't to take up space. So I want you to listen this morning to the clear assignment God has given each of us if we are a follower of Jesus Christ. So Jesus pulls together a band of men and he pours his life into this little band of men for three years. And as I've looked at that over the years, I've said either that strategy was stupid or it was supernatural. And I believe it was supernatural. And so he, he sets a movement in motion where he begins to pull these guys together and then he goes to the cross and he said, I'm going to die, I'm going to rise from the dead, and I want to meet you guys in Galilee. And so he meets them after he rises from the dead in Galilee and then he makes this great proclamation, go and make disciples. Every year, as you think about what does this thing mean to make disciples that Chad was talking about, the scriptures talk about, every year I'm told that uh, Vince Lombardi would bring out a football before his team. He'd hold it in front of him. I left, actually left my ball in the car. Should have brought it in. But he put the football in his hand and laid it in front of his guy. He says, fellas, this is a football. Why did he do that? Because he wanted to remind them why they were there that they were going to be focused, they were going to be prepared, they were going to be committed, and all the rest that you have to do to be a great athlete and have a great team. In the same way, Jesus is laying before us this concept, this strategy called making disciple makers. Let me give you a couple of thoughts here before I really jump into this. Uh, one of the great uh, 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 people today and companies that gives us a reading of what's going on in our world in terms of the, of, especially in America, of the, of the Christian church, the faith, etc. George Barna, he says this, in one recent nationwide survey, we asked people to describe the goals of their lives. Almost nine out of 10 adults describe themselves as Christians. Four out of 10 said that they were personally committed to Christ, had confessed their sins, believed they were going to heaven after they died because of God's grace provided through Jesus' death and resurrection. But, it's always the buts that kick us in the butt, isn't it? But, not one of the adults we interviewed said that their goal in life was to be a committed follower of Jesus Christ or to make disciples. And then in brackets he says, this survey, by the way, included interviews with pastors, church leaders, as well as hundreds of people who regularly attend church services and programs. We're dying, man. We're dying. So Dallas Willard, one of my favorite authors uh, who died not too long ago, said this. For those who lead uh, or are minister, there are yet graver questions. What authority or basis do I have to baptize people who do not have, or excuse me, who have not been brought to a clear decision to be a disciple of Christ? Dare I tell people as believers without discipleship that they are at peace with God and God with them? Where can I find justification for such a message? Perhaps most important, do I as a minister have the faith to undertake the work of disciple making? Is my first aim to make disciples or to just run an operation? 
a glorified maintenance man. I've gone all over this city and this country talking to pastors of big churches, medium-sized churches, and small churches. And you start talking about what we're getting ready to talk about now, and they say, I'm just too busy. I got too much going on. We already got all these programs. And they have no, if I sit in a group, and I've done this, of 50 ministers and say, Matthew 28, what does that mean to go make disciples? I get 50 different responses, if any response at all. I met with a group of 20 church planters here in Dallas not too long ago, and I read Matthew 28, go make disciples. I said, what does that mean? In about five minutes of silence, finally one guy spoke up, a minister, with, and he, what he said was half right. So this is a big deal. My goodness. Let's, let me read one more little passage here. In, in Psalm 78, which I haven't read much until recently, the scripture says, O oh, my people, verse 1, Psalm 78, hear my teaching, listen to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter hidden things, things from old, what we have heard and known, what our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from, our, from their children. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, His power, and the wonders He has done. He decrees statutes of Jacob, etc., 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 so that the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born. So there's got to be a transference of the essentials of the faith, on and on and on. And part of our job is to do that with confidence. Oh my goodness, i got so much I want to say and my time's already getting going here. So what does it mean to make disciples? In uh, Matthew, excuse me, in 2 Timothy, very familiar verse, chapter 2, Verse 2, Paul is trying to uh, encourage this young man, Timothy, probably 15, 16, 17 years old, to galvanize his faith. But he says this in the second chapter of the second verse. Timothy, the things that you have heard from me, Paul, among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Another translation has the word entrust, which is a banking term. And trust to faithful men who will then teach others, who then will teach others, who then will teach others. And so that's, that's what the call is here. So if you take the word disciple, actually the word Christian, how many times is the word Christian mentioned in the New Testament? Anybody have an idea? Three times. First call Christians where? Antioch. BSF student right over there probably. So in Antioch, how many times do you think the word disciple is mentioned in the New Testament? bunch of them. Approximately 269 times. So if something is mentioned 269 times, what would they say to you in terms of its importance? It's rather important. So if you do your due diligence and you look every one of those terms up, and if you stick them in the top of a funnel, out of the bottom of the funnel drops three things that it means. And this is what you need to get. Number one, a disciple according to the scripture, first of all, and this is a package deal. You don't pick one of the three that you want, that you want and are most comfortable with. To be a full orb disciple maker, it's all three. Number one, a disciple, first of all, is a learner. <laughs> biblically speaking, now get this, biblically speaking, true learning only takes place when it's exposed to the truth. Does not mean we've been changed by the truth? A lot of men, I think, in this culture, a Christian culture we live in, have been educated way beyond their intelligence. Think about that one. In other words, we know more than we do. And God is impressed with what we do with what we know, not how much we know. Some of us are dying by degrees. But anyway, the second thing a disciple is, a disciple is a follower. And the, kind of the idea behind it is it's like an adhesive. It's something that sticks to something else. And in this case, it's a man that sticks to Jesus and follows him, which means I take orders from him. I say, yes, sir, what do you have for me today? If I sign up to follow him, the implications of following are demanding but life-changing. But here's where most people that think about discipling and talk about discipling totally miss the boat. 
The third thing the scripture teaches that a disciple is, a disciple is a reproducer. It's taking the essentials of the faith and with confidence building or investing those into the life of another believer so that that person has a faith foundation to build on the rest of their life. When I go to churches, I can go up and down the best churches in Dallas, go up and down the pew and, and say, I'm interviewing some people today at your church. Would you just give me three or four minutes and, and tell me some of the essential things, just give me a little outline, of some of the essential things of your faith. A lot of awkward moments. And like we were talking down here a moment ago, there are, there are other faiths, world religions, where the people are more trained, more articulate about what they believe and the apologetics of, of really sticking to what they believe as opposed to Christianity. And we're sitting over here sucking our thumb. Man, we got to get with it. We got to get daggone with it. So when I talk to people about this and making disciples, here's what they say here's some excuses. Um, wasn't that meant for, uh, wasn't that meant for people that are in the ministry, like ministers? Well, that's not right. No, it was meant for every believer of all time. Here's another one. I'm just too busy, John. I just don't have time. So oh, no, hold on just a second. This little strap's slipping down over my shoulder here. So, uh, I'm too busy. So let me ask you this. So you're going to stand before the Lord someday who gave you his son, who came after you to rescue your sorry butt. He did all that, and you're going to look at him and say, but Lord, he's looking around, where are all your guys? Well, Lord, I'm, I'm just too busy. You really going to say that to him? Wow. Or here's another one. I'm just not called to be a disciple. I'm not either. I'm commanded to be a disciple. In Matthew 28, where Jesus says, Go therefore into all the world and make disciples. That's the imperative in the Greek, and it means it's a command to all believers of all time. And we got to get that one down. Here's another one. Uh, I don't know enough. Bubba, you're never going to know enough. Just take what you know and do something with it. Um, I have a luncheon like this that I do down in the park cities. We've got about 300 men that show up on uh, Wednesdays at lunch. And we've been doing it for about 12 years, and it's really been amazing to see how these guys are getting it and beginning to, not all of them, they're not all getting it, <laughs> but they're beginning to begin to do this stuff. But anyway, one day I had a friend of mine where I go to church, uh, Richard Ellis at Reunion Church, a church that's a third white, a third black, and a third Hispanic. And I love it, absolutely what heaven's going to be like. And so I said, Richard, get up, and, and I was talking about this subject, and I said, get up and just say a word. So the first, you never know what Richard's going to do. So he gets up, and he looks out this audience, about 300 men, and he said, anybody here raised in an orphanage? First thing out of his mouth. After a couple of moments, the guy on the right, second table back, raised his hand. He said, I was. He said, do you mind if I ask you a question? He said, no, it's fine. He said, when you were in the orphanage and you knew a visitor was coming through, what were you thinking? The guy said, that's easy. Please pick me. And then Richard looked out at all these men. He said, most of you guys go to some real good, well-known church in the Dallas area or Fort Worth area. He said, let me tell you something. For the most part, in all those churches, ain't nobody going to pick you. Because we run programs. We don't pick people. Disciple making is about somebody picking you and about you picking somebody, spending time and walking with them, building a faith foundation into their life. That's what this thing is all about. And if I were to ask you now to take a sheet of paper and, and, and you say, well, I understand discipling. Okay, if you understand discipling, then I want you to line up your men behind you that are discipling others. And here are the three questions I would ask you. What is your plan to make disciples? Number two, write out the, least, uh, the names of at least five men that you've discipled. And number three, take each one of those guys and tell me somebody they're discipling. Then we find if we're multiplying or not. In Dallas, Texas, the basic concept of disciple making is we back up our biblical theological truck, we dump it out, we pull off and say, we discipled you. It's an information dump. One of the biggest things that men need are friendships. And that's what uh, Chad was trying to get over in the beginning when he made some of his remarks. 
Disciple making involves deep friendships. So to me, the issue involves obedience. Am I going to do what Jesus told me to do or not? That's the issue. You say, well, I feel uncomfortable. Well, so what? We all feel uncomfortable a lot of times in our lives. Well, we've got to get over that. We're here. There, there's a bigger issue. There's a bigger issue at stake here. Other than being obedient, how are we going to change our country? You only change your country by changing people, and the only one that can change people is Jesus Christ. That's the only way it's going to happen. And so, somebody said, well, is this talking about evangelism, reaching people that don't know Jesus? That's part of it. So you say, what's the game plan? Uh, and I, I didn't bring my books this morning on purpose because somebody said, well, yeah, he just wants to sell books, so you, you ain't getting a book. But we wrote a book, uh, a buddy of mine and I did, and we use this all over the country as men disciple others and as women disciple other women. It's called The Four Priorities. And let me tell you what that's about briefly. Matthew 22, I kept looking for a cliff note version of something in the scripture. When I was going to school, I always liked cliff notes, but I was, I was looking for a cliff note version of everything Jesus taught. And I came across years ago that passage in Matthew 22 where Jesus said, all right, here it is. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. The second commandment is likened to the first. You love your neighbor as you love yourself. So we see four things falling out of there. Number one, love God. We call that a personal progressive commitment to Jesus Christ. So in this book, the first seven chapters are all about how to make your relationship with Jesus hum. Secondly, most people at this point get busy for God, but he said the second commandment is you love your neighbor. How? As you love yourself. And here's the thesis behind the second commitment, which is loving yourself. You will only love somebody else to the degree you love yourself, and you'll only love yourself to the degree you know how much God loves you. There is an epidemic in our country, whether you're 9, 19, or 90, of low self-esteem and a lack of understanding our significance. If you've got kids, every day they hit that school, it's a zoo because they're trying to measure up, be okay, comparing themselves with other people, and men do the same thing. So the second priority, we talk about what God thinks about you, and then we lay out Luke 2.52, the same way in Jesus grew. How do you develop physically, mentally, socially, and emotionally? Obviously, spiritually, that's priority one. Priority three, he says, love your neighbor. Who's my neighbor? The Bible says love everybody, but especially those of the household of faith. So the third priority we call a personal commitment to other believers or the body of Christ. And underneath that, we talk, how do you make your marriage sizzle? Three chapters on that. We talk about how to be a great daddy. Three chapters on that. And then we talk about how to function with other believers and why that's important based upon John 17. The fourth commitment, who's my other neighbor? Those guys that don't know God from Donald Duck. And so the fourth priority is a personal progressive commitment to the work of Christ in the world. And so we train and equip a man to know how to live effectively where he is every day, which is usually our work, but then also how to engage other men in such a way that when the time is right and the Holy Spirit works, you don't duck, but you lovingly speak up and say, all right, here's what this thing's all about, about Jesus. And you can articulate the faith concisely in an articulate way that makes sense. Who's Jesus? What did he do? Why did he do it? Why do I need it? How do I get it? All of us need to be equipped to do that. So that fourth priority is making a difference in the hearts and lives of others that don't know Christ. Well, <clears throat> I'm about done. My time's about gone. We've got about two minutes left. What would happen, and probably maybe 10% of you will do what we're talking about. And I hope that really ticks you off. Because if, if, if only 10% or 5% do it, the rest of you, where are the rest of you? You're mooching off of God. You don't like people to mooch off of you, do you? You know when somebody's manipulating you or mooching. Don't mooch off of him. Be grateful for what he's done and show up and say, Lord, here I am, let's go. I'm tired of just sitting in the background. I've been robbed of courage and I want to get out there and make a difference for you in a winsome way. Very key to understand that. So, 
Are we working? Is this thing working up here? All right, put, a, put up the next chart and just put one line up. So if one guy takes two guys, for example, for a year and goes through this, and when, I, when we do our training for this, we tell guys, only pick guys that will make a commitment on the front end, on the front end, not the rear end, that when you're done, gone through the process, they will make a commitment. When we're done, I'll take two guys a year, and I'll only pick guys that make that same commitment, and I'll do that for the rest of my life. This is not another little Christian churchy program. This is right out of the scripture. It's to be our lifestyle. So if you do that for one year, at the end you got three. Well, that doesn't sound like a lot. How about the second year? What do we got? Second year, we got nine. Well, it ain't, still ain't real big. You know, Greg Laurie comes in here and they pack out 100,000 people in ANTT Stadium. 4,000 people come to Christ. Let's go on. 27 in the third year. So if the exponential factor kicks in and there's no attrition in 10 years, let's go all the way to the bottom and look at the right column. You say, that doesn't work. It doesn't work because we hadn't worked it. I could line guys up here right now. And they could begin to give their stories of not only how they've been discipled, but the men that's lining up behind them around this city, in San Antonio, in different parts of the country. This is what's got to happen to change the planet. God's plan to change the planet is disciple making. That's it. it this beats preaching any day of the week. We need preaching. We need a good expository, biblical preaching. It's teaching. This beats it every day. All right, let me close with this. The next time you feel like God can't use you, just remember, Noah was a drunk, Abraham was too old, Isaac was a daydreamer, Jacob was a liar, Leah was ugly, Joseph was abused, Moses had a stuttering problem, Gideon was afraid, Samson had long hair and was a womanizer, Rahab was a prostitute, Jeremiah and Timothy were too young, David had an affair and was a murderer, Elijah was suicidal, Isaiah preached naked, Jonah ran from God, Naomi was a widow, Job, Job went bankrupt, Peter denied Christ, the disciples fell asleep while praying, Martha worried about everything, the Samaritan woman was divorced more than once, Zacchaeus was too small, Paul was too religious, Timothy had an ulcer, and Lazarus was dead. What's your problem? That's all I got. <clears throat> Amen. Amen. Sit down, guys. I want to just chat for a couple minutes here as, as a follow-up to this. You've been challenged? Spirit been convicted? Been pierced? I want to make a secular argument for this. There's a book written in 1997 called The Fourth Turning. The authors were not Christian, but they went back and looked over our Western European history, and he basically, the authors surmised that there have been turnings or periods, genealogies of years, 80 to 100 years in multiple cycles, getting back through in 20-year periods in chunks. There's four different phases. It's very similar. I would make it comparable to the cycle of Israel. You know, you're, you're following God, complacency, sin, and then God's judgment. But it's basically the same thing. What he has looked back since the Every 80 years, we have gone through a crisis period. Sitting back in the early 1700s, prosperity, end of the French and Indian Wars, bam, Revolutionary War hits. Prosperity, um, Western expansionism, uh, manifest destiny, complacency, judgment, civil war, 80 years later. Prosperity. Get back into the roaring 20s. Stock market's booming. Things are hitting. What happens next? Depression. World War II. Well, guys, we're coming up on our fourth turning based on this history. In every generation, there has been a generation of heroes who has stepped up to the plate and has made a difference in our country and in the United States. The last greatest hero generation was the greatest generation, the World War II generation. We're fixing to get another one here in 2020 to 2025. 
And as I've said it before, the millennials right now are 50% of our workforce at that time, and they'll be 70% by 2030. Who's going to be that hero generation that's going to step up to the next crisis that we face, whether that be an economic crisis or a potential world war? It ain't going to be you and me. It's going to be the millennials, the young guys. Bingo. That's our challenge. That's our challenge. Man, if you ain't convicted over that, I'm going to check your pulse. So, guys, that's why we here at Wingman, what we're, what I'm going to, what we're going to do, January 27th and 28th, we're going to be back here. It's a Friday and Saturday night. John Tulsa is going to be here. You know, Dudley will be a part of it, too. What we're going to go through, he just barely tipped the top of the iceberg here with the material that he's presented. But we're going to go through, I don't want to call it discipleship training, but it's information to prepare you to go out and to get comfortable with the material and the four priorities. But here's the thing. I know a lot of you, like myself, I've never really discipled anybody. I've mentored people, but I've never discipled anybody. I'm a little, what's that all about? Because here's the thing, whether you're going to plan on intending to do it or not, I'm going to highly, highly, highly encourage you to be there for this. Because what you can do is, you're all in your element groups. Bobby, you can get with Dwayne. You can get with somebody. Bill, you can get with Prasad, where you can go through the material with somebody that you trust to familiarize yourself with the content, to kind of work through it, so you can get over that aspect of fear. But guys, the challenge is out. Don't be part, it's, it, in the world, it's always the 80-20 rule. 20% of the people do all the work and 80% of the people benefit that. Don't, don't be the 80%. And this is a challenge. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm serious about everything, guys, but it's not a political process. You cannot legislate morality. Guys, this is what we're doing. This is what we're, we're called to do. We're commanded to do it. I want to look at everybody's eyes to make sure you see what I'm, I'm, I'm talking about here, guys. I'm serious. Are you? You guys made it all the way through. Congratulations. I'm Corey Huddleston with Wingman Ministries, and I want to welcome you guys, and thank you for taking the time to watch the video. If you enjoyed it, please give our speaker some love by hitting the like button just right below me right now. If it's your first time to visit the Wingman channel, make sure you hit the subscribe button in the lower right-hand corner. You guys have a great week. We'll talk to you next time.